Today we're in downtown Geneva to go someplace where no journalist has ever gone before. We'll be going inside the private vault of the Tudor Watch Company. So David, if you could, tell us a little bit about the earliest days of Tudor. Yes, everything started in 1926 with the acquisition of uh, the brand De Tudor by Hans Wilsdorf. And then in the following years, the first watches come, especially during the early 30s. This is, for example, well illustrated by a model we have here from 1932. It was a period of very traditional, smooth, classic styles. The brand name is written with a particular typology with a T of Tudor going over all the letters of the brand name. So after around you know, 1932, when this watch was made, until really the post-war era, Tudor as a brand didn't really exist. It was really after the war that it became a real pillar of, of this family. Absolutely. It was really after the Second World War that uh, Wilsdorf envisioned the development and the creation of a second brand name and started to produce dedicated watches under the brand name Tudor. And this is, for example, illustrated by this second watch where we can see the application of a number of patented technical development, notably the oyster case and the self-winding rotor mechanism. So this is one of the early oyster prints. So I think the, the next watch is really something that represents the Tudor brand well because it's something that, that we still see even today. Absolutely. Here is an alarm watch, reference 7926. The movement is the Andre Shield 1475 with an alarm function. The design is very pure, double crown, very clean aesthetics, very interesting watch from our history and that's why we decided in 2011 to reinterpret it and put it into the heritage product line. The brand name is Advisor, we decided to keep it as it was at the time, 1957. And this line continued on through the 70s. You have another advisor here as well. Absolutely. It continues later on with another case, which is not anymore an Oyster case. And because we were shifting into the 70s, the whole design of the dial really changed with more square and graphical, typical of the 70s indexes and hands. I think something interesting about this particular example is this case is totally foreign to the Tudor family. You don't see another watch from, from Tudor or Rolex that looks anything like this case. So another, still even today, a large part of the, the Tudor family and DNA is dive watches. And so the Tudor Submariner was built kind of alongside its brother at the exact same time as the Rolex Submariner. Correct. Wilsdorf launched the Rolex Submariner in 1953. And a few months later, in 1954, he launched the Tudor Submariner. So we have here a rare example of the very first Tudor Submariner from 1954, the reference 7922. We can see the very clean design being the very first execution of the Submariner line. This very first reference was 100 meter waterproof and uh, was followed a year later by the 7923. If we look at the design of the watch, there are very interesting elements. For example, these straight ends, which are quite rare. And again, we found a similar bracelet with plates and rivets, but also with uh, connection links linked to the lugs, which is straight. Very interesting detail in a tool watch, and that's why we picked it up and decided to use last year with the reinterpretation of the Ranger into the Heritage product line. As, as a lover of, of vintage tutors, the 7923 is kind of one of those pieces that y you hear about all the time, but you almost never see. It's, Absolutely. it's the only manually wound dive watch ever made by the family. The pencil hands, it's just something you, you really don't see. And it, it wears, you know, it's so thin with the hand wound movement that you could wear it, you know, almost as a dress watch. These references were followed four years later exactly by the reference 7928. We can see a new bezel a little bit more technical, a little bit more tough, with indication each minute in the first 15 minutes to cope better with the diving requirements. Important change also on this reference is the fact that the watch becomes a little bit bigger. It was 37 millimeters for the previous series, it becomes 39 millimeter, more adapted to the function of professional diving. 
So after the 7928, we had a, a big change, not only in the movement, but also in, in the looks of the Submariner. Absolutely. This is what we call the second generation of Tudor Submariners. It's the end of the Florier Movement 390 and the beginning of ETA movement, in this case, the ETA 2483. Following a demand of the French Navy, the Marine Nationale, Tudor developed a specific shape for the hands to distinguish the hour and the minute hand when we were deep diving. The brand came up with this particular square shape, which is today very well known as snowflakes. And at the same time, the indexes of the dial shifted also from round to square. And also the usage of different colors, not only the black one, but also the blue one. And that's why last year we used a dark blue into the new Black Bay Midnight Blue. This reference 7016 was followed by the reference 7021, which is absolutely identical in most of the characteristics, except the fact that it also bears a date. We can still see very well this bevel which goes along the lugs between the flank and the upper side of the lug to create a very strong design element that we have picked up again in both the Black Bay and the Heritage Chrono. This reference was followed a few years later by the reference 9401, which we see here in the black configuration. This same series of reference was also produced later on in a blue version, which is the one that was sold to the Marine Nationale Française, to the French Navy. The fact that those were actively used and exposed to salted environments created an almost infinite number of nuances of color that are called by collectors tropical effects. So how did the, the Marine Nationale Submariners differ from the commercial watches that were sold to the public? This is very interesting because they are absolutely the same from the rack, which means that the standard production was already coping with the requirements and demand of people using it in extreme condition and in a very intense way. And then we get to the third series of diving watches, the series 79,000. So how do these watches differ from the, the 1970s watches? We have a different design of the dial, which is mainly brought by the usage of triangle instead of square shapes at 9 and 6. The usage of the date and the usage of particular color, as for example for this model from the late 80s, all in burgundy, which was clearly an inspiration for us for the choice of the color of the bezel of the 2012 Black Bay burgundy. Another big tenet of Tudor would be the, the chronograph. And so Tudor has a long history with, with racing watches. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of what we have here? Everything started in 1970 with the first chronograph, which is the series of references 7000. You can see this very particular graphics, two counter, the minute counter of 45 minutes, which was quite unique, linked to the length of the races of that time. These particular colors, gray, black, and orange, very linked to the spirit of the 70s. Pentagonal indexes, very unique, which are called on plates by collectors. This one is the reference 7033, and is a very particular one because this configuration has never been produced. This is the original prototype, which has been sitting in the company for the last 60 years. So the others that were produced uh, were this particular one with a steel engraved bezel, the reference 7032. This one is in perfect condition. So this watch, as well as the prototype, have never left this building? Correct. So this will give a collector an idea of what these watches should really look like in an ideal world? Absolutely. Then this first series, the 70,000, was followed by a very well-known second one, which is called by collectors Monte Carlo, is the series 7100. You have here different configuration. It started from 1971, the following year, with different color configuration. The gray and the black one, but also a gray and blue one, very Mediterranean and very unique. That's why we decided to pick it up, this particular configuration for the Heritage Chrono Blue of 2013. 
you have a configuration with a steel engraved bezel and you have the application of the bioretable bezel with a 12 hour display on both color configuration the gray and blue and the gray and black and what are the movements inside these chronographs the 7734 on the first series the 7000 and the 234 with column wheel on the second series, the Monte Carlo, the 7100. And then after this series, we then go into self-winding. Exactly. After this series, we go into self-winding with the series 9400. The display of the dial changes with three counter in a vertical disposition. The very first series bears colors which are very linked to the 70s with the gray and orange and black as in this one and with the black and orange and white of this second series. This series is called by collectors Big Block because of the different thickness of the case brought by the usage of this particular movement. And we're followed by other versions which gives a more classical look and feel of the dial. And then finally we have the, the last generation. Absolutely, which is the 79,000. The final generation differs mainly by the flank of the case, which is no longer straight and a little bit thick like this one, but which becomes polished and rounded in a more contemporary look and feel of the watch.